Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Common Council meeting. Once again, I ask that the Alderman place their microphone as close as they can here. Aside, I still had people calling and asking that I ask the Alderman <coughs> to please. Uh, we do have a lot of viewers, believe me, they're out there. Before we start our meeting again, mm -hmm. I asked the uh, City Clerk to read the quote for the week and maybe a little announcement. A Madam little City announcement. Clerk. Um, voting is the most precious right of every citizen. And I thank the mayor for just giving me one minute to just remind the public, in case you've forgotten, tomorrow is election day. It, it is proving to be one of the biggest elections the city has ever, ever seen. Um, what we saw downstairs today just proves to me that the, tomorrow's election will truly be history making. Uh, the polls do open at 7 a.m. in the morning and they close at 8 p.m. And what I wanted the public to know is that we have several older people that have generously volunteered their time tomorrow to either be a greeter or a poll worker. And just so you know, you may see familiar faces in the polls. They will be the aldermen. However, they will be taking off their aldermen's hats that day. They become part of my team, the poll worker team. And I want to thank each and every one of them for doing that. So if you do see an alderman at your polling place, They've become part of my team so that we can get through this election process successfully. So I would like to thank all of you that have done that. And we will see you all tomorrow. Would you like your extra minute? Uh, no. <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. You're done? Thank you, Sue. Call the 15th regular meeting of the Common Council to order. Please call the roll. Boren. Here. Bauk. Here. Decker. Here. Gisha. Here. Hannah. Here. Heidemann. Here. Kittleson. Here. Kleunis. Here. Meyer. Here. Montemayor. Rinfleisch, Here. Ryan, Here. Zurich, Here. Vanderweel, Here. Verhasselt, Here. and Wangaman. 16 present. Quorum is present. Alderman Zurich, would you please lead us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Surik. Approval of the minutes, President Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move for the approval of the minutes. Second. Motion and second to approve minutes under discussion. There is none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Minutes stand approved. Mayor's appointments. Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Honorable members of the council, I hereby submit the following appointments for your confirmation. Rachel Newton to be considered for appointment to the Tourism Advisory Committee to fill the unexpired term of Rick Peterson, whose term expires 4-30-2010. Leo Messner to be considered for appointment to the Tourism Advisory Committee to fill the unexpired term of Linda Jarr whose term expires 4-30-2009, and Mark DeSombre to be considered for appointment to the Tourism Advisory Committee to fill the unexpired term of Kara Leonard, whose term expires 4-30-09, <coughs> signed by the mayor. And those appointments will lie over? That was attached to that mayor. And we have confirmation of appointments. Uh, Alder person Edward Surick to be considered for appointment to the Sustainable Sheboygan Task Force to fill the unexpired position of all the person uh, Vicki Meyer, whose term expires on 4-2009. Signed by the mayor. Thank you, Attorney McLean. I need a motion to confirm. President Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would make a motion to confirm all the person, sir. Second. Motion and second to confirm. Any discussion? There is none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Appointment is confirmed. Congratulations, Alderman. Public forum, Madam City Clerk. Yes, this evening first on the list would be Joan Scribner. Joan, if you could come up to the microphone, please. And if you want to pull the microphone a little bit closer to you, Joan, that would be great. And you will have five minutes. Thank you. Mayor Perez and Chewing Common Council, thank you again for another opportunity, opportunity to be able to talk to you again. Um, part two, uh, I don't know if I said this last week or not, so forgive me if I'm repeating, but um, on the issue of the Bob and Tom comedy show that was at the Wild Center on October 3rd, 
I did get a chance to talk to Randy, um, the manager over at the Wild Center on Wednesday, October 15. Um, it seems he was in a financial bind trying to pay for the expenses of running the Wild Center. The Bob and Tom Comedy Show on October 3rd was a sellout. Uh, the profits to the Wild Center was about $8,000. And that one night that had more profit than an entire season of the Sheboygan Symphony. And that's kind of a sad commentary for, for us, the city of Sheboygan. Another sad commentary is that Randy would rent the Wild Center to the Bob and Tom Comedy Show again in the future. Um, again, the almighty dollar seems to take priority over mor morality and decency. Didn't the Regis Digest once recommend Sheboygan as the best place to raise a family several years ago in the past? Well, how are we doing now, Sheboygan, on, on that issue? Uh, then I had also left off uh, about the sex respect uh, curriculum that was taken out of the public schools some years ago. Um, uh, I feel the answer should be yes to abstinence only, uh, yes to a sex respect curriculum in the Sheboygan Public Schools. Too bad it was removed from the Sheboygan Area School District some time ago. What about sex before marriage? What about living with a member of the opposite sex before marriage? What about recreational sex or a one night stand before a marriage? What about adultery? Where does the Sheboygan Common Council, <clears throat> the Sheboygan Police Force, the Sheboygan Area School District, Planned Parenthood, and the social agencies of the city of Sheboygan and Sheboygan County stand on these issues? Are adultery and living together before marriage still wrong? Or did rules against these lifestyles fly out the window sometime in the past? Or maybe is God still right when he said you shall not commit adultery? Exodus 2014, and flee fornication, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee to run away from fornication, sexual intercourse between unmarried people. A good movie that did play in Sheboygan uh, uh, was uh, Fireproof, starring Kirk Cameron. Uh, a good firefighter and a good cop will live by this rule, never leave your partner behind. And that's also a good rule for marriage, never leave your partner behind. On another subject, whatever happened to God in the arena of public government, city, state, and national? Whatever happened to God in the public school arena? Uh, for, the remo for the removal of God from our public schools, I guess we can thank Madeline Murray O'Hare, who decided that maybe we don't need God in the public schools. In 1963, she was responsible for the removal of Bible reading and prayer from the public schools. Have you walked the hallways of schools in the Sheboygan Area School District lately? Try it. Take a survey. Watch the teachers trying to promote respect, courtesy, good behavior, and maintain discipline, all without the mention of God. How does that even work? Because courtesy, good behavior, and respect are values that are given to us from God. Uh, go in the Sheboygan Area School District hallways and watch and listen to the kids. Walk in the school hallways and classrooms and do your own survey. Um, we should thank God for the Christian schools that we do have in the city and in the county. Also, we should thank God for See You at the Poll, which was here in Sheboygan on September 24th. And we should thank God for organizations like Campus Life and the Campus Life Family Center out on OK, near Judy's Place Restaurant. Campus Life helps kids who are in middle school and high school. Campus Life reaches out to middle school and high school kids in Sheboygan city and county schools. I cannot say enough nice things about Campus Life. The one word that does come to my mind is life changing. On another subject, whatever happened to discipline in the public schools? Who was it that said it was now a crime to put the Board of Education, i.e. paddle, to the seat, i.e. the back part of the body, of learning? Why is it now illegal to take a 12 inch ruler to a disobedient child's knuckles when the child is being defiant or disorderly in the classroom? Is it now illegal to throw a chalkboard eraser at a student who is talking too much or is being disruptive in class? I had an elementary school teacher who was an extremely good shot with a, with a chalkboard eraser. I was, got that several times for just talking in class. Um, now when I say that I'm not an advocate of, uh, when I say that I am an advocate of phys physical discipline in the school, classrooms, or at home, or out shopping for that matter, I am not referring to child abuse. I am referring Excuse about... Me, John, would you like your additional minute? Yes, please, thank you. Go ahead. I'm talking about inflicting a light pain on the pupil to help him or her realize just a little bit better that disobedience just will not be tolerated and that swift punishment 
will soon take place. Um, I know this is not politically correct to talk about God and Christianity in the public arena. But we Christians do want our country back. And since the United States of America was founded on Christian principles, we want our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, to, we want the freedom to talk about our faith. We are tired of the ACLU and the freedom from religion people telling us that we cannot display the Ten Commandments in our government buildings, that we cannot pray out loud to the one true God, the creator of the universe, that we cannot, play at school, we cannot pray at school football games and graduations, that we cannot talk about God in our government or in our schools or in our workplaces, that we cannot send Bible verses in emails to our staff. Excuse me. Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our list is Sam Guerin. Thank you. And Sam, can I have your home address, please? It's 187 Maple Drive. And that's in that's Plymouth. Plymouth. <coughs> and you will have five minutes, sir. Thank you. Mayor, Council, thank you for this opportunity to address you tonight. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the uh, proposed additional cuts for the Department of Public Works budget. Um, the, uh, the budget, as it, if it's cut further, would be a $1.2 million cut in the 2009 Public Works budget as compared to 2008. And my question is, what important public services will be cut this time? Uh, Sheboygan residents have already suffered many cuts to key public services in recent years. Uh, for example, let's take a look at Public Works staffing. There's been an unrelenting reduction in staff at the DPW since 1970. But this has been the worst decade so far. <clears throat> From 1970 to 1980, 12 of 207 positions were cut, or 6% in that decade. From 1980 to 1990, 42 of 195 positions, or 22%, were cut. From 90 to 2000, only 7 of 153 positions, or 5%, were cut. But in this decade, from 2000 to 2009, as proposed to you today with the additional five cuts, 37 of 146 positions are 25% of the DPW staff that are cut. <clears throat> However, the required work has increased. Since 1970, the number of street miles have increased uh, by 33% from 150 to 200 miles. And the acres of parkland that these employees maintain has almost doubled in the period. Uh, the public works budget, uh, despite dramatic increases in workload, materials cost, fuel cost, that budget has risen very slowly since 1997, increasing by 11.5% or about 1% per year, while the police budget rose 53% in, in the same period and the fire department budget rose 46% uh, in the same time period. Uh, the, the DPW provides services that are every bit as important as fire protection and police protection. For example, street maintenance. Crack sealing prevents the potholes that damage vehicles and keeps water from getting under the pavement, uh, causing additional damage, uh, preventing uh, road repair costs in the future. The Public Works have, employees have traditionally performed tarring of cracks in city streets between April 1st and November 1st to prevent potholes and buckling. In 2008, the tarring crew was only utilized 93 out of 150 possible days, and there were only two workers on the crew instead of the traditional four. Uh, making the crew less than half as productive as they usually uh, usually were, I guess. Uh, and then street repair. When the streets do need repairing, the public employees uh, at the DPW perform the work, preventing damage to personal vehicles and <coughs> business fleets. Since 2006, the amount of concrete poured by Public Works employees to repair city streets has declined by one-third, showing we are not keeping up on the repairing of our streets. What about our storm waters? Public employees clean out our storm sewer system to prevent flooding of businesses and residential properties. Out of 33 catch basin cleaning routes, only 3.5 were cleaned in 2008, compared to 8.5 in 2007 and 12 in 2003. 
Approximately 29,000 feet of sewer pipe was cleaned in 2008 compared to 38,000 in 2006. So we're really not taking care of the stormwater system that prevents the flooding. Uh, if we have another serious uh, storm event like we had a, uh, a few years back, uh, we could see some serious damage again. Uh, what about our sanitary sewer system? Public um, uh, Works employees also clean out our sanitary sewer systems to prevent sewage backups into homes and small businesses. They cleaned 173,000 feet of sanitary sewer pipe in 2006, but in 2008, the footage of pipe cleaned fell to a 15-year low of 109,000 feet. Uh, cleaning up these, uh, keeping the sewage backup from happening protects private property and the inventories that the small businesses rely on. What about parks maintenance? This is the first service slated to be cut next year. Do we really want our children playing in weedy, unkempt parks where refuse collects and bathrooms go uncleaned? The cut in the public works budget proposed for 2009 will allow taxpayers to save approximately $5 property tax per year on a $100,000 property. How does that $5 compare with the potential cost they face if roads need increased repair due to lack of maintenance, if their vehicles are damaged, or if their properties or inventories are damaged by floodwaters or sewage? Let's not be penny wise but pound foolish. A $5 per year investment could save hundreds or even thousands of dollars down the line. These types are, of investments are what make a city attractive to investors and families. Excuse me, Sam, your time is up. Would you like your additional minute? Please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's hard enough to attract people to locate in urban areas without the blight that sends people off to the suburbs. We're on the eve of an election day. Reminds me of a certain president we had, oh, about 60 years ago. When economic times were really tough, what did he do? Cut everything in the government, or did he put people to work on the public works projects, some of which, like the Hoover Dam, are considered some of our nation's greatest accomplishments. That's what FDR did when economic times were tough. He put people to work. And I think we should follow his example and not gut government and the public services that make our city great, but uh, put people to work, making Sheboygan an even better place to live than it already is. Sometimes taxpayers and their elected officials need to make small investments that pay off for us down the road. We ask you, to reject the proposed cuts to the DPW budget and send the committee back to develop a budget that will not further reduce city services. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Next will be Henry Capitillo. <clears throat> and Henry, can I have your home address, please? Yes, that's uh, 1619 North 38th Street, and that's in the town of Sheboygan. And you will have five minutes, sir. Thank you very much. Before I get started, I'd like to uh, thank the council, and especially some of the council members that have been working diligently with the police department on the cost-saving efforts and also to do some of the, uh, the uh, early retirements and things like that. I, You know, that's... That in itself is come a long way for previously on some of the issues that we had with the police budget and some of the problems that we had with getting, getting um, the necessary resources. I think that the uh, council is moving in the right direction. Uh, I know that uh, there are specific council members that have really have done a lot of work in that area. I know Alderman Gisha, Alderman Hanna. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you for all your efforts and other council members that uh, I haven't mentioned. Uh, I know that uh, you've tirelessly worked to try to cost savings on the police department, but yet at the same time to try to get more officers on the street. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here today is that I know last, last council meeting that you voted for the early retirement and part of the... Uh, the reason that you did it, and I know that some of the council uh, 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 aldermen were, were specifically saying, you know, if you want more officers on the street, you, you should vote for this, this early retirement. And I think that uh, by doing that, that you pretty much said, we are going to put more officers on the street. And I'm here to basically say that I think that uh, the uh, Taxpayers in the city and and uh, also other individuals should come here and should make sure that that happens. 
and that the officers actually get put on the street. And um, I know that I had talked to a couple of the aldermen, and they said, well, you know what? We've done our part, but the police and fire commission are the ones that do the, the hiring of these positions, and something, um, it, it really isn't, it isn't appropriate for us to be contacting them and to be getting on their, their backs to do this. So uh, at times you come here to speak to the council, but also to speak to the people that are at home. And I'm asking for the, the people at home to contact the police and fire commission and to make sure that they move on getting these officers on the street. I, I just heard that apparently the police and fire commission isn't even gonna meet until December to talk about the possibility of what the procedure is going to be on hiring of these people when I think that uh, you can actually go and post these positions and actually go out and publicize this and you don't have to, to be, be meeting and looking over and going over applications and that can come at a later date. I'm thinking that if you really want to get a, a head start on this, that you really should be looking at posting these positions and getting and start recruiting the necessary people that you need to do to replace these positions. Um, I, you had the, uh, the representative from Police and Fire Association or the police association that was here that also was concerned about making sure that the process moved on and that for, for that to happen. So what, what I'm asking for the viewers at home is to contact the police and fire commission members and let them know that you'd like to see this to move on and to, to expedite this and to get this moving. And the other thing that, that uh, I think we have great police officers in the city of Sheboygan and police staff that are administrative staff because uh, I've had contact with them. I know that uh, we have more than enough qualified people to be able to look that the police chief should be hired within the police department. I don't think you have to go outside the city to be hiring a police chief. I think you have enough qualified staff within the department to fill that position. And I'm asking the people at home to also contact the Police and Fire Commission members and to say, you know what, it's, it's right. We definitely have enough qualified staff within the police department to be able to fill the police chief position. And I think that one of the things that you do, I know that when you're looking at going outside the department is if you have turmoil in the department or there's a special expertise that you need. But you know what? I think you have that already within the Sheboygan Police Department. You have more than enough qualified staff. Uh, I don't think there's turmoil in the police department. I think that it's, it, it, it's run quite well. I've, I've never had one bad incident with any police officer that I've had contact with over the period of time that I've, and sure, I've, and I've been pulled over. I know that uh, it hasn't been lately, but you know what, I, uh, I did not have a bad situation. And the officer was very courteous. Um, Excuse me, Henry, your five is up. Do you want your additional? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I got a warning for a burnt out taillight that I had to get fixed, but you know what, never had a bad incident. And the other thing uh, I'd like to say is, I know that, uh, I don't know if you're gonna be t uh, voting on the, uh, the ban for using cell phones today, but I think that's a good situation, I really do. How many times do we sit behind somebody that is, you, you think that they're either intoxicated or whatever, and then you find out you see them there on a cell phone. I think that that is a good thing to do, and I, think, and I hope that you do pass it. Um, I think that uh, it would be a betterment for safety in the city. And the other thing I'd like to say is, it is really encouraging to see more people come to the public forum. Uh, uh, one of the city employees was here to talk about the public works budget. We had some other individual that was here. Even though you may not agree with some of the things that these people say, it is encouraging to be able to see that in this, this council. And I'll tell you what, this is what's so important and is so fantastic about this country. Me, that Henry. people can come here and speak and not have to worry about anything. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. And last on our list is Paul Gruber.
And I'm thinking you may want to move your mic up a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and Paul, can I have your home address, please? 508 Bullrath Boulevard. All right, and you will have five minutes, sir. Your Honor, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, everybody here knows the danger of using a handheld cell phone while driving. When we see other unsafe practices, such as driving the wrong way on a one-way street or speeding or driving drunk, we pass ordinances or laws prohibiting such behavior. I specifically know a young man who's from Sheboygan. Here's his picture. This is the end right here. Um, he's now a teacher in Manitowoc. About eight years ago, he was in the back seat of a car with a seat belt on. The driver took a call on his cell phone and ended up smashing his car into a tree. David, the young man in the picture, uh, no longer has the use of his legs. He's a paraplegic. Numerous university studies have shown that talking on a cell phone and driving are equivalent to driving under the influence <coughs> of alcohol, and it increases your chances of having an accident by four times. Our mayor wisely convened a committee to study the issue of using cell phone while driving. This committee unanimously voted to ban handheld cell phones while driving and that enforcement shall be a primary offense. We need a law where people will continue to dangerously ignore common sense. Other municipalities in Wisconsin, as you probably know, uh, Racine and Marshfield, have recently passed ordinances prohibiting the use of cell phone while driving, and this is happening throughout the country now, throughout the world. There's been some objection that this would amount to over-regulating. The argument being that you'd have to put a ban on people putting on makeup, people shaving, people eating while they're driving. No. The use of cell phones clearly stands out way beyond these other things. I'm asking the city council and the common council members this evening to produce an ordinance that will prohibit the use of handheld cell phones while driving and that enforcement be a primary offense. Protecting the safety of the citizens of Sheboygan should be paramount to you, its older people. Passing this ordinance would reinforce that. I have talked to many citizens, police, truck drivers, and they all unanimously want this ordinance. I believe that getting a number of cities to do this would make it much easier for Terry Van Akron, for Joe Ivan, to then get a statewide ban on this dangerous activity. As I'm pledged every day with the safety of the people I take care of, I believe you are pledged with the safety of the citizens of Sheboygan. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you to all the citizens that are, who addressed the council. Alderman Hessel. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to ask that document 1539 be pulled forward. Okay, let me let me go through the motions first, and then we'll pull it out. All right. Okay? Thank you. Uh, con consent agenda. We have 15, one through 1514. Uh, I'm sorry. What 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 number did you want? I'm sorry, we can do that. My apologies. 1539, pull forward. To, uh, item to be referred, page page 5, by Alderman Montemayor and Sir, repealing uh, substitute, substitute, re substitute resolution number 13109-0809 as amended and providing raises for non-rep employees for 2009. Alderman Rahasfield. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to have this document filed. Second. Motion and second to file under discussion. Under discussion, thank you, Your Honor. Um, you know, we've, having been on the Salary and Grievance Committee for the last number of years, this issue is, has been there at the surface for a long time, but even at the council level, it's been in front of us for the last four or five weeks or more. Um, as recently as this last council meeting, we made, a, uh, we made a move to pass a small increase along to our city employees. There's just, and I guess, Going back even to the beginning of this year, I, I guess, again, being on the salary and grievance, I saw this coming not only now but down the road. 
and I presented an article from the Sheboygan Press, which was printed in February of 2008, and that highlighted a study by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that showed that state and local government employees earned on average, on average, 35% more than their private sector counterparts. Okay, um, moving forward, Sheboygan Press article, October 12, 2008, again talking about the financial times of our constituents, the people that we work for here in this council, talking about the number of people in poverty continues to grow and is significant. Um, stories of young families and elderly people who continue to deal with limited controlled incomes. And people in the county, sadly enough, choosing between health care, food, rent, and, and uh, Medicare, or medical, medical care. And then more even recently, the Sheboygan Press printed an article, State Families Earning Less, October 17, 2008. And this was a report, it was highlighting a report from the Center of Wisconsin Strategy. And they looked at a period of 2000 to 2006. And during that period of time, they found that in Wisconsin, the, the median income for a four-person Wisconsin family was down approximately $6,000, or over 7%. That's the, again, the median income for a four-person Wisconsin family. Compared to the, to the, nation, to the nation, uh, the nation is down about 3.4%. 3, 3 and then even more recently, Alderman Bauck uh, did some nice work just analyzing numbers here right at Sheboygan City Government. And we looked at the average city employee, city employee, that's everybody, union, non-union, 5.29% increase. There were approximately seven groups represented within those numbers, and the ranges were from 4.62 up to 9.22%. Those are average annual increases to wages. Again, 4.62 up to 9.22, an average of five, over five and a quarter. <coughs> to put that in perspective, again, he had also, Alderman Bauck had also wisely pointed out what the average Sheboygan resident had earned during that same period was an average of 0.81% which was really the, the premise for the number that I presented at the last council meeting, in which we subsequently passed as the Sheboygan non-rep pay increase, 0.81%. Let's put that in perspective. If you had a $40,000 income, you had two people starting the same day, one for the city, one for the average city employer. During a 10-year period, the city employee, well, let me back, during that 10-year period, a city constituent with that average increase would go from 40,000 to just under 44,000, $43,712. Okay, so a growth of about $3,712. Now by comparison, if I worked for the city, started the same day with the same wage of $40,000, I would now be up to $70,521. That's a 5.29% annual average increase compounded year after year. So you can see in that scenario there, there's nearly a $30,000 advantage working for the city. Same, same day, same, uh, same starting pay. So there's a huge disparity, and I guess, again, I've been noticing this for some time, and I think there's something that we need to do as a council, and I think our time is now. Uh, in addition to that disparity in pay, let's look at things like health care costs. The average resident in the, in the state of Wisconsin is paying between 25 and 30 percent of their premium share, of their premium cost. The average city employee is just now getting up to approximately 10 percent. So the, again, going back, the average resident is paying on average two and a half times the amount of premium. Let's look at another factor beyond the disparity of the wage is that's the impact of our savings. The average constituent, whether it be in the city of Sheboygan, the state of Wisconsin, or the USA, has saw a decline in their in the retirement savings via 401k of 30 to 40 percent in the last year. 30 to 40 percent. Some possibly worse, some a little better. The average city employee has a little different scenario because we pay into the Wisconsin Retirement Fund, saw an increase of approximately 10 to 12 percent during that period of time. So you've got our constituents, the 3,500 that represent that I represent in my district going backwards 30 to 40 percent on their savings while the city workers are going up 10 to 12 percent. Okay. I guess in summary, I, I just want to point out, to me, this is not personal. I think we have a lot of good city employees. I've been now in the city government here for approximately two and a half years. And the more I get to meet the city employees, I find that we do have some very good quality people. So this is not, uh, I guess this is not an issue where me, I'm trying to make things personal or trying to get even because that's not the scenario at all. 
everybody here realizes that we're in some of the worst economic times uh, that this country has ever faced. And with that, combined with all the figures I just shared with you, these types of increases, 5.29, up to 9.22 in some departments, are just not sustainable. The only way they are sustainable is to continue to put them on the back of our constituents who, the Sheboygan Press pointed out, saw a $6,000 decrease in their net personal income over the last six years. So that scenario just doesn't add up to me, and, and that is the premise for uh, myself asking to file that document. Thank you. Did you wish to speak on Alderman Montemayor? Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, thank you, Alderman Verhassel. I know you've done some, some good work on that, and Alderman Balk, you've done some studies on that. Now, I didn't bring with me tonight the remuneration committee findings, and I bring them almost every time, and of course this evening I didn't. That was a committee that was formed about maybe two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago by the previous council, and they studied the remuneration for the, for the city employees compared to the state compared to the other parts of the city of Sheboygan. Their findings, their numbers, were in some areas a little higher, some areas a little lower, but the salaries were, on the average, the same as private industry. Where the difference was, was the benefits. Absolutely, the, the municipal employees had better health coverage and better benefits. But their findings, with the help of a wonderful a firm that they paid that knows how to do this very well, their findings were that the wages matched the rest of the, of the citizens in this area. Thank you. Alderman Sark, you're next. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I concur with uh, everything Alderman Mayor said, because I was on the committee for, uh, for the period of time it was, it was active. But uh, my point is a little different. Um, at our last meeting, we eliminated the, the pay plan completely. So for all practical purposes, there is no pay plan for non-represented employees at this time. Alderman Rahasso at the last salary and grievance meeting suggested a new pay plan. And that was going to be presented at the next salary and grievance committee. I'm, I'm saying let's wait to see what Alderman Rahasso's recommendations are for the plan, look at other pay plans before we move ahead uh, with the resolution that's currently on the book. So let's, let's have a structure to what we're going to do before we do it. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. Next. Thank you, Your Honor. I, uh, I rise in support of filing this document, but probably for a little bit of different reasons. Um, it was excellent point on the remuneration committee. That is correct uh, that salaries were a little up, a little down, depending on department, but benefits was the real kicker. But I got news for you. Benefits come out of the same checkbook as salaries come out of. It's the aggregate number and the total number we have to look at in reality, because that's what we have to pay. So. Uh, I too believe we have remarkable city employees, non-represented employees, represented employees, um, and they will be getting, as this council passed last council meeting, a raise this year. However, Pentair Industries 150 employees will not be getting a raise this year. They won't be getting a paycheck this year. JL French employees will not be getting a raise this year. They haven't gotten a raise for two years. The Kohler Company layoffs, now upwards, I believe, of 150. They won't be getting a raise this year because they won't have a, they won't have a paycheck to buy Christmas presents this year. It is the economic times we're currently living in. A person could have made a very, a very good argument for a pay freeze this year. We didn't. We gave a small increase in wage. and. And I think that should not be lost uh, on not only our citizens, but on our, our, uh, our non-represented employees. Front page article in the Journal Sentinel today, the State of Wisconsin Investment Board, the folks who manage the pension <laughs> funds for these individuals in city government, who the taxpayers pay roughly 12% every year into for them, has gone down dramatically because of these economic times. They've announced that that money is, they're going to come back to municipalities, the city of Sheboygan, the taxpayers of Sheboygan, and ask for those monies to be accelerated and an increase in how much we participate at, with taxpayer money going into the state of Wisconsin. There will be increased expense for employees in 2009, some that we don't even know about when the, until the SHWIB, State of Wisconsin Investment Board, comes to their final numbers. Um, so I stand in, uh, in support of filing. The, the Salary and Grievance Committee, has a, it's a difficult committee. It's difficult work. 
But they've had this issue two or almost three times. It was sent to them that came back with no recommendation. Sent to them, came back with no recommendation. Finally, the council acted at the last council meeting and through, its, through the, the vote and the leadership within this room, passed a small increase where others will get no increase. And we've solved this issue. This issue has been put to bed. Are we gonna now have another resolution in two weeks of somebody taking the two and a half percent that's being proposed and knocking it down to one and a half percent? I believe the council's dealt with this. We have a budget, those numbers are plugged into the budget and we need to move on. Thank you. Alderman Bulk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I too rise in support of filing this document. Uh, and I just wanna be clear about some of the numbers uh, that are being quoted tonight. Uh, those numbers come from, uh, from the Sheboygan City Department of Finance. Those are our numbers from our own internal numbers. They do not include benefits. The, the numbers that I cited in my letter and that uh, Alderperson Verhassel has cited do not include benefits. Those are wage increases. Um, this, is not, this is not to punish. This is not anything other than a realignment. In my article, I wrote about how um, the way we've raised non-represented salaries is just disconnected from the local taxpayer's ability to pay. And I know in the unionized world, they have all kinds of arbitration tools that can prevent us, uh, that, can, that can stall us from trying to keep it aligned with what our taxpayers can pay. Um, but with our non-reps, we have the power to say, look, your salary has gone up twice the rate of inflation, and that's what the numbers say, twice the rate of inflation every year since 1999. And I'd be happy to share these graphs with anybody. That doesn't, that, and good for you, I, I'm a big capitalist. I, I think everybody should negotiate every penny they can get. I try to negotiate every penny I think I'm worth, and clearly I'm worth more than I'm getting paid, just like everybody else out there, right? We're all worth more than we get paid. We come back to Earth, where people have to demonstrate their value every single day. Uh, we find that the council acted last week to get rid of the pay plan, because after 10 years, that pay plan was just too disconnected. And what that salary and grievance committee said was, I, I don't think the intent was to solve that this year. I think what came out of the resolution was that we would hire someone to help us write a pay plan that was more effective, a pay plan that could be sustained for the next 10 years and that would in some way be connected to our taxpayers' ability to pay. Alderman Gisha has, has done very well at pointing out um, how the city of Sheboygan's taxpayers may not have the ability to pay more next year. And I just want to make one more point, uh, and that has to do with, um, shoot, I lost my, lost my train of thought. So what it comes down to is, is uh, we, we've had this on our plate for a long, long time. Again, the Salary and Grievance Committee couldn't, couldn't decide this in a timely manner. The council acted. We've got a number that is affordable. It is a gesture of good faith. And in 2009, we can act to solve this in 2010 in a way that's more in line with our taxpayers' ability to pay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, on a motion to file. Please call roll. Warren? Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me, Bauk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? No. Clayunas? Aye. Meyer? No. Montemayor? No. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Surik? No. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhassel? Aye. And Wangaman? Aye. 12 ayes, 4 noes. Motion carries. Consent agenda 15-1 through 15-14. President Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that all ROs be accepted and placed on file and all RCs be accepted and adopted. Second. Motion and second under discussion. There is none. Please call the roll. Bauk. Aye. Decker. Aye. Gisha. Aye. Hannah. Aye. Heidemann. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Clionis. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Rinfleisch, Ryan, Zurich, Vanderweel, Verhassel, Wangeman, and Boren. Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. Communications and petitions, 1515 to be referred. Report of officers 2, 1516 through 1527 to be referred. Resolutions introduced, 3, 1528 by Alderman Montemayor, accepting the dedication of property for public street purposes. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Is there a second? Motion and second, under discussion. There is none. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 1529 by Alderman Meyer, Montemayor, and Gisha, approving claim number 208, submitted by way of oral number 330809 in full. <coughs> Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second under discussion. There is none. Please call the roll. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunis? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Surik? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhassel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Boren? Aye. And Bauk? Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. 1530 by Alderman Gisha, Clayunis, Montemayor, Bauk, and Boren amending the City of Sheboygan's investment policies. Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second under discussion. President Hanna. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just two things. I, I want to commend the uh, Finance Committee for uh, doing this. It's so important that the investment policies of the city are reviewed on a continuous basis. And I also do want to do want to comment that I'm very impressed with uh, Terry Hansen and the work that he's done. Uh, he took time out of his schedule to call me, ask for some feedback. I think it's, it's just great that they're moving forward with this. Very good. Any other discussion? There is none. Please call the roll. Gisha? Aye. <clears throat> Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunis? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Surik? Vanderweel? Aye. Verhassel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Boren? Aye. Bauk? Aye. And Decker? Fifth, oh, I'm sorry, 16 eyes. Motion carries. 1531 through 1533 lies over. 1534 through 1539 to be referred. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. On agenda item number 1537, I would move to, sus to suspend the rules. Is there a second? Second. Second. Under Not discussion, please explain. Yes, I will. Um, I think it does not need to go to Plan Commission again. Plan Commission has looked at this twice already. And CELCOM needs the power to operate the police department cell tower, but the Alliant Energy won't turn it on until the Common Council says yes. Okay. Pretty simple explanation. <laughs> Thank you. On the, on the uh, motion to suspend the rules, we need a two thirds vote? Uh, three quarters. Three, three quarters, 12. Yes, uh, Attorney McLean. Only if there's some objection to it. Only if there's an objection, yeah. I'll take the vote. Okay. All in, call rule. Okay. Hannah. I'll take the rule this time. Just Aye. Heidemann. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Clayunis. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Surik. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Wangaman. Aye. Boren. Aye. Bauk. Aye. Decker. Aye. And Gisha. Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. Motion. To, uh, motion to, what is it, a resolution? Yep. Put it upon its passage. Yes, please. The, I, I'm going to move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Thank you. Motion and second. Any discussion? There is none. Please call the roll. Heidemann. Aye. Kittleson. Aye. Hi, Eunice. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Surik. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Wangaman. Aye. Boren. Aye. Bauk. Aye. Decker. Gisha Aye. and Hannah, Aye. 16 eyes. Motion carries. Report of committees 6, 1540 and 1541 lies over to November 24th. 1542 and 43 to, to be passed. Alderman Meyer. On 1542, I would move that the RC be accepted and adopted. Your Honor. Motion and second under discussion. <laughs> That's fine. Motion and second. Any discussion? There is none. Please call the roll. Kittleson. Aye. Clayunis. Aye. Meyer. Aye. Montemayor. Aye. Rinfleisch. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Surik. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Verhasselt. Aye. Wangaman. Aye. Boren. Aye. Bauk. Aye. Decker. Aye. Gisha. Aye. Hannah. Aye. And Heidemann. Aye. 
16 ayes. Motion carries. 1543 by law and licensing recommending denying beverage operator's license number 8049 based on the applicant's failure to include all relevant conviction on the application. The record is a repeat law violator. The record, the record of violations related to the license activity and failure to cooperate with the committee. There might be one too many records there, but that's all right. <laughs> all of them, uh, Vice President Borang. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted. Motion and? Second. Under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, is uh, Brenda Kanabi here tonight? She's not here, Your Honor. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, Ms. Kanabi failed to appear uh, at our committee after, giving, after being given uh, two opportunities, one by certified mail, so it was a un unanimous uh, decision of the uh, committee to uh, uh, deny the uh, application. Thank you, Vice President Boren. There is no more discussion. Please call the rule. Clayunas? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Surik? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhasselt? Aye. Wangeman? Boren? Aye. Bauk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. And Kittleson? Aye. 16 ayes. Motion, motion carries. 1544. Alderman Hannah, do you wish to address that one? Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd ask your permission to uh, pull this away from being referred to the Board of Parks and Forestry. It's already been there. Okay. Need a motion then to. I'd make, uh, then I would make a motion that the uh, report of committee be accepted and adopted. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. Under discussion. Pre yeah, thank you. We have an opportunity here uh, to do something truly uh, fantastic for a portion of our communi community that is underserved. Uh, we have an opportunity to develop a park that will be accessible to children of all ability. Uh, this effort is being led by uh, Ryan and Angie Shaw. Uh, we already allocated one of our free days at the Blue Harbor for them to hold a conference on this. Um, I think it's just, it's one of those good things that's going to put Sheboygan on the map. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Your okay. Honor. Um, this has already been approved through Public Works, and we discussed this at Park and Forestry last week. Captain Wieser made it very clear that the location for this playground would be excellent for the city. It um, ties into your water safety program. Having the community down at D-Land Park also decreases the vandalism. And he also stated that even though there are festivals down there, they are not as attended as they used to be. And as the Shaw's, um, Angie Shaw has um, stated to us numerous times, when she goes to these festivals, it'll be nice for her to bring her, her children. Thank you. And just a point of clarification, we're not really, in, in the true sense, creating a park. We're adding equipment to a park that we already have, and we do that all the time. But we usually have to pay for it. In this case, there's a group that proposes to pay for it. And sometimes, because of the busy people that we are, we tend to be neglectful and not provide the resources for other children. And this is an excellent opportunity for this council to do so. Any further discussion? Otherwise, we will call a roll. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Surik? Aye. Vanderweel? Verhasselt? Aye. Aye. Wangeman? Aye. Boren? Aye. Bauk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. And Clayunas? Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. Report of Committee uh, 7, 1545, by law and licensing, recommending denying beverage operator's license number 7570, based on the applicant's record of violations related to the license activity, and the record is a repeat law violator. Vice President Boren. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted. Second. Motion and second, under discussion. Under discussion, Your Honor, is Juan Coronado here tonight. It's not here, Your Honor. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, Mr. Coronado did, be, did appear before our committee on October 28th, and after uh, listening to uh, his comments regarding his uh, criminal background, that was a unanimous uh, decision uh, to deny the, uh, the uh, license based on uh, his uh, violations that were related to the license activity and his record as a repeat law violator. Thank you. Any other discussion? There is none. Please call the roll. Montemayor? Aye. 
Rinfleisch, Ryan, Zurich, Vanderweel, Verhassel, Wangeman, Boren, Bauk, Decker, Gisha, Hannah, Heidemann, Kittleson, Kleunis, and Meyer. 16 ayes. Motion carries. 1546 and 15, through 1550 lie over to November 24th. Report of Committee 8, 1551 by Finance, recommending approving the Capital Improvements Program recommended by the Capital Improvements Improvement Commission for the program period 2009 through 2013 and adopting to the 2009 program for implementation with the following amendment to the program to remove the 266,000 in general obligation borrowing and the corresponding 552,000 total cost of the salt storage shed. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. On the amendment to remove the money for the salt shed, I would like to hear on the council floor make an amendment to put that salt shed money back into the original capital improvements uh, amount that was studied a lot by the Capital Improvements Committee. And then the Plan Commission studied it a lot. It came to finance, and it, didn't, it wasn't unanimous to remove the salt shed okay. from Capital well, Improvements. It was three well, to two. Is there a second to that? Second. Second, okay. Please continue. And I think our department head, Bill Bittner, has a safety and the judgment the safety concerns of the citizen and the judgment to guide us in the correct decision to get the salt shed. Right now the salt shed is very old. The salt on top is hard. It's can't, some of it cannot be used and the salt leaches into the earth every year that's on the bottom. We have needed a salt shed for a long time. Capital Improvements this year studied this, talked about it, put it on as one of their priority items. Excuse me, Mayor. Could I ask Alderman Montemayor something? Yes. Alderman Montemayor, could we do it with you making a motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution and then make that amendment, please? Would that be all right? Thank you, Susan. Yes. Okay. And then who made the second on that motion? I didn't hear. Clayunas. Okay, thank you. Alderman Rinfleisch. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, actually, that was my uh, point of order that I was going to wait to see. Is Actually, we have a report of committee. Um, we really can't amend the report of committee. This the committee is reporting back to us with, with the recommendations uh, to adopt that. Um, so I commend the city clerk for the proper procedure. <laughs> as you know, I'm a stickler for that mm -hmm. uh, as well. Thank you. OK, thank you. Alderman Gisha. Thank you, Your Honor. I've been kind of involved with the salt shed thing quite a bit. <laughs> um, a couple of comments. Uh, finance doesn't have to unanimously pass anything. No committee has to unanimously pass anything, so it's irrelevant. It was passed by the majority of the Finance Committee. And here's the reasoning. I know we have a lot of people who watch this and probably don't know what a Capital Improvement Commission does. What they do is they take basically pitches from all the department heads on all projects that are capital oriented. In other words, basically buildings and improvements and brick and mortar stuff. Uh, and then the committee rates those individually, I believe there's like seven individual committee people, they individually rate those based on priority and based on how they feel the effect will be for the community. And out of that comes your capital improvement program of about $3 million every year. So it's really a very interesting committee as it involves an actual rating system with no politics involved. It's individual, nobody knows who's voting for what. You come in, you have a workbook. It's really very well done and organized by the finance department. And uh, out of that comes this program. Uh, the amount of money is $266,000 for a salt shed, but unfortunately the salt shed costs $522,000. It didn't make the cut financially. So the process worked. The procedures and, and following of the protocols of the Capital Improvement Commission worked, and we happened to have $266,000 left over and the thought on that commission, as I sit on that Capital Improvement Commission, voted against this, was to, well, well, we'll toss that 266 in for a salt shed, and then we'll pull some money out of the motor vehicle fund, and then we'll do this, and then we'll do that. Well, the problem is Capital Improvement cannot encumber these other committees, or the Finance Committee, or this body, for any future funds. The idea of a Capital Improvement Commission is the projects stand on their own as a whole. That's how we always have done it. I've checked back into the records. Uh, we, we fund long-term prog projects, 
but they are an entire project. This does not have funding for next year. This is a, we got a little bit of money, let's throw it in, let's find the rest of the cash and shove it in there. I think you can make a case that a salt shed's a great idea. I think Bill Bittner makes a case for a salt shed need. The timing just is not good for spending this amount of money. By the way, this also lowers our borrowing by $266,000 for the Capital Improvements Fund, as uh, Alderman Bourne had made this amendment in finance. Um, so it didn't make the cut. If it made the cut, it would have been $522,000. It didn't make it. So the process worked. And therefore, trying to bring this in in kind of a, a half-financed way doesn't work. So that's why I believe uh, it should be passed as amended. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. That's pretty much what we were talking about at finance, this back and forth. Um, however, if for some reason the, um, uh, the public works <coughs> is not able to find the total amount of money for this very large salt shed that would guarantee enough salt for, for eternity, a smaller sh salt shed, where this money would take <coughs> care of that, is so much better than what we have now. Thank you. Alderman Kittleson, you're next. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I sit on the Capital Improvements Committee as well, and um, um, uh, the salt shed did make the cut I in my mind. I thought it was an important uh, thing to go forward with, uh, listening to the, the arguments for it. Uh, we need the salt shed. Uh, we are getting cited, from what I understand, um, uh, on a yearly, uh, so not, not being fine, but we are being told that this salt shed, this, what we are storing our salt in now needs to be replaced. And, and I think the, the cost here for a, a salt shed that will last 50 to 75 years is well worth the, co the cost of, that we are going to spend for this shed. It'll, as we know, the cost will get more and more with each passing year. I think now is the time it did make the cut in my mind. I think this is a good project that we should go ahead with. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Ryan, you're next. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling. Sorry, Alderman Bourne, you're next. Vice President Bourne. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> uh, I, I don't support the salt shed for, 2000, for 2009. Uh, when we're faced with possibly laying off five people in public works uh, because of budget problems, I can't support spending this amount of money on a salt shed. Uh, last week, I spent some time with uh, uh, Deputy Director of Public Works, uh, David Beeble, because I couldn't remember the layout of the salt shed, so I went down and took a second look at it, because I hadn't seen that for about two years. And with all due respect to uh, all our person uh, Kittleson, uh, even, even uh, Deputy, uh, Deputy Director Beeble had to kind of laugh and say that for the, there's a DNR person who apparently has too much time on their hands to come down and talk to us about five, five or ten shovelfuls of salt melting and getting into the sewer system at the Public Works Department when we're putting 4,400 tons on the street and that's going into the sewer system. Perhaps, perhaps that, uh, that uh, if that uh, DNR person had something else to do, we wouldn't have a, a $3 billion state budget for next year. Uh, also, we are contracted. We are contracted for the winter of 2009 for 4,400 tons of, of salt. And the way it works right now, the existing salt shed holds about 1,000 tons, which means in an average winter, they have to fill up the salt shed about four times. We're locked into the state contract at $48 for this coming winter. Uh, it has gone up from past winters. Last year, it was about $35 or $36 a ton. But the public works director and his staff wisely got into the state contract for this winter. Uh, I, just, I just cannot support it in this climate, budget climate. And also, there's a document that I referred tonight, document number 1519, which possibly is an unfunded state mandate by our beloved DNR, which says it's a 2002 law that passed that says that all cities in Wisconsin have to be in compliance uh, with reducing their stormwater runoff and contaminants by 40% by the year 2013. Now, unless the state backs off on that 2002 regulation, my figures show that starting in 2010, we are going to have to bond an additional $2.3 million for 2010 
2011 and 2012 to be in compliance by 2013. The good news is Sheboy, the Public Works Department has done a good job so far when they've been doing sewers and putting in updated catch basins. Oshkosh, which is about the same size as Sheboygan, if you'll notice the chart in the article, Oshkosh is faced with over $18 million between now and 2013 to come into compliance. So that's all the more reason that I, I can't support the salt shed. I consider the, the salt shed a want, not a definite need, especially in this budget climate and with the possibility of having a $7 million unfunded mandate that we're going to have to come up with the money for by, by 2013. Thank you. Oman Ryan, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm not on the Capital Improvement Commission nor on, on, on finance. Um, therefore, I'm not a, a genius in either one of those fields, obviously. But, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at this, we, you know, we, we have $266,000 that we are not going to have to borrow under our capital improvement plan. Uh, what we're looking here, though, is, is the total cost being $522,000 that somebody is hoping to take out to find somewhere in the, ca in, the, in, the, in the public works budget. Obviously that money's not there if we're talking about laying off five or six public works workers, there's a possibility of that. Now, I don't think statutorily we can borrow money on capital improvements and shift it to, to public works uh, payrolls. However, if we are looking at possibly finding in their budget another 200 and some odd thousand dollars, to make up the difference to the $522,000, I would hope in that budget we can find a way to keep those employees and to keep the city services rolling. So therefore, I'm going to vote against this salt shed. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Your Honor. I was just going to reiterate what uh, Alder Person Bourne said uh, in that it, it's a, I see it as a want. When we talked about this in finance, there are a lot of things that Sheboygan families want this fall and want for next year as well. Uh, but Sheboygan's families are finding ways to cut back and live with what they've had. Uh, and so I would urge uh, my colleagues to vote in that spirit on this and, and not support the salt shed as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Alderman Rinfleisch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I came armed with three or four different points, and I've heard three of them. <laughs> the fourth one I simply want to add is uh, a long-term view. We are building a shed, or we would like to build a shed worth 50 to 75 years worth of use on there uh, within the city boundaries but not belonging to the city are the county sheds that are located on North 25th Street as well. I can't imagine that, that long term 50 to 75 years down the road those sheds will still be in the county hands. As the city grows, as the county focuses on their streets outside the area, uh, I could definitely see working shared services with them if you will to use that area for the benefit of the city and the benefit of the county as well. So I do see that right now it doesn't make sense to me to build one for 50, 75 years when there may be one that we have access to or can use you know, within our, our, our locality already. Thank you. Alderman Verhessel. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to ask uh, Department Head Bill Bittner to come into the dialogue, if that'd be all right. Uh, I have a number of questions I for him, if that's all right. Yes. Uh, oh. Mr. Bittner, please step up. Mike's on. Thank you. Yeah, I, guess. I, was, uh, I guess just backing up a little bit, just uh, curious as to the rationale for the new shed. It was stated that there's a good case possibly out there. I'm just curious to hear it in your words or hear your thoughts on the rationale. And if there are any savings as a result. Okay. Last year, toward the end of the winter, I received numerous comments from our citizenry and numerous comments from individual councilmen that we need to improve our snow removal effort. That wasn't acceptable last year. That is the basis for which I put together a plan that didn't revamp all our snow removal efforts, but attacked or tried to attack the weakest parts of it. A big part of that, which will also be part of uh, the storm's water permit, is managing our salt use. And the most critical part, we've got millions of dollars worth of vehicles out <laughs> fighting snow. We, we use most of our employees, which also have millions of dollars of budget each year, fighting snow. We put together a huge effort to fight snow, but the limiting factor, when you look at things and how they work, 
The limiting factor has been in the year I was here, uh, in terms of the quality of the product we can put on the street, in terms of the snowpack, and some of some of the problems in terms of safety, in terms of accident prevention, is how much salt we had. Last year, we spent most of the year without salt. Previous years, we had very mild winters, we didn't. So the issue is not so much do we need or do we not need a salt shed, it's what level of service are you willing to have on your streets depending on what winter that is. That varies dramatically with the weather. That's just, that's just what it is. Um, the salt shed and the budget that was initially proposed came from that report that I made about how to enhance our snow plowing effort. It was based on attempting to have enough salt available for a worst case winter is probably not the right term, but a very, very bad winter. Uh, typically in the past years of mild winter, uh, we use about 4,000 to 4,500 ton. Uh, the salt shed that was proposed uh, would be in the seven to 800 ton. In other words, you'd go through that bad winter uh, because one of the problems with building a smaller facility is everybody has salt until you have the bad winter, then nobody has it. Uh, so if you, you, if you do not have the ability to, to uh, address the amount for the bad winter, uh, you'll still run out at those times. That, our situation, I think it was already cited up here, we are able to store about a thousand ton. You can't ever get in the situation <coughs> where it's gone. You don't use a thousand ton, then order a thousand ton. You have to constantly be fighting to keep that replenished. In the mild winter, it's always available. In the bad winter, it's not. Uh, that's, and that's where we are. Uh, but that's the logic that went into it. I do not believe it's an issue of, of whether or not we need a salt shed. It's an issue of whether or not the services we provided last year, which would probably be very typical of a severe year, were adequate. But the limiting factor is salt if they were not. Yeah. Follow-up question here. Would there be any savings in the purchases, I mean, as a result of buying or taking receipt of more volume, a larger volume of salt? You have a huge amount of savings buying off the state bid. Um, we just received an email today from somebody who was actually advertising their salt for $127 a ton. We're paying in the 40s for what we have. So you, you have a system that buys in advance, a system that buys in huge quantity, almost all municipalities in the state, and has very, very low prices. prices so, and, and to take advantage of that system, you have to be able to buy when it's available. So you're not going to save from what we're buying. You're, the benefits would be to have it available because no matter how cheap it is, if it's not available, cheapness doesn't mean anything. And, and so it's really a level of service thing. But you're not going to change the price because you're already grabbing that very low price or at least market comparatively low price. So there'd be no, uh, yeah. whether it be a 500 ton shed or a 5 million ton shed, as long as we pre-buy, the savings are in the pre-buying, and it comes down to more of availability issues. Yes, what I you're think you're, that's exactly right. Alderman Reinflesh had brought up, just commented, passingly about possibility with the county shed. Have we looked into that over the last year about the possibility of sharing any of their facilities? We've discussed it briefly with the county. Uh, they use their salt sheds. Uh, like everybody else this year, they're, they're filling them all up in advance. Um, last year, we talked ex extensively with the county, but you know, they were in the same situation we were. Uh, they, any salt they could get. Uh, they would take any salt we had allocated at that time. So salt was quite critical last year, very unique and high snowfall year. Uh, they have indicated some preliminary plans uh, to move out of their existing facility. They have a relatively modest and aged salt shed in their existing facility. Most of their new salt facilities are spread throughout the county, which only makes sense. They're, they're, they built them where they, where they apply the salt. Uh, so there, there might be some opportunity there, but it would be, be limited simply because of what their, what their facility currently is. This is the facility on the 23rd Street yeah. site, is that right? Okay. Um, Alderman Montemayor just commented passingly as well about a smaller salt shed option as a possibility rather than the $522,000 facility. Is that, did I understand that right? Is there a smaller option out there? 
If you base the size of the salt shed on my original proposal to the capital program, it was to build that factor of safety in. If you, if you visualize a salt shed for 1,000 tons where you almost always know you're going to, excuse me, need 44,000 to 4,500, anything that would double your capacity or triple your capacity would be a huge operational advantage. Some of the issues is, and, and most people, there were a lot of salt sheds built this summer, but most were enhancing what they had. I guess what I was asking, and, just, and so it, yes, it just to clarify, would a new smaller salt shed be better than no salt shed at all? Yes. Okay. Um, and then what is the future use of the existing salt shed? What's the, is the, there the, some? The existing building is, is not a salt shed. It's a space in the existing metal structure. It was originally put there as a gravel bin. However, uh, if anybody's been down there, you can realize what the salt has done to the superstructure because it's metal. Uh, it also, one of the, to clarify the, the DNR issues is where you maneuver and haul salt uh, needs to be covered. That's, that's the theory. It's not just whether or not some melted. A salt shed needs a, big, a high enough roof to be able to dump a load of salt into it. Ours, you have to dump it outside, then shove it in the in the building, kind of a, a cave-like operation. It's worked. It's been that way for many years. I was wondering if there was a motivating factor on you already had a use for that old salt shed for something else. I guess is where I was. Oh, we, we're short of space, so it automatically that, becomes storage for many of the things that are down there and, and be covered. Yes. Okay, and then my last, I guess, my last question or comment is just that I share the sentiment of Alderman Ryan is that we have an issue of cutting employees or buying a new shed, and I'd. I appreciate what you've said, but I, if worse comes to worse, I guess I'd rather hold on to the employees. I don't know if that would, if you'd share that same view. That's a well, loaded question. Well, I'd love question, to hold on to the employees. Uh, Public Works is a entity <clears throat> that requires materials, equipment, and employees. If you get one out of balance, you lose service anyway. In the snow removal effort, salt is out of balance right now. Uh, so the number one way to improve snow removal is to make sure we got salt. Now I say that knowing if you have a very mild winter, you'll have salt. Um, obviously in the bigger picture, uh, we'd like to keep as many people as we can. That's it. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I've got some lights popping up here, but I just want to make some points of clarification and information. Uh, the first one being that the Capital Improvements Commission did meet uh, several times, I believe five or six times, and there's seven people, and there was a lengthy process of presentations, questions, deliberation, and a, sub a subsequent rating system that was done. The Soul Shed did make the cut. It wouldn't be before you if it hadn't made the cut. Not only did it make the cut, it got the votes with only one person voting against it. Subsequent to that, it went to City Planning Commission. It made it again, unanimously. The issue uh, is, is a safety issue, as Bill has clearly stated. Are we going to be responsive to the people's pleas for better snow removal in an overall program? As Bill stated, we can buy all the salt we want cheap now to save us thousands of dollars. Where are we going to put it? We can buy it, not have it delivered, which is what we've done. When the winter comes and the mother nature pounds us, we own it on paper. You don't have it because everybody else wants it. Everybody else needs the salt too. We're not isolated over here to where we're the only ones needing salt. As for layoffs, first of all, I dare not even suggest, nor would hope an alderman would suggest to do borrowing and capital improvements to hire, to keep people, or to keep us from laying off people, you wouldn't want to do that for a lot of reasons. And one of them being you, you're going to have to pay interest on that. I believe the council's resolution, uh, uh, resolution or ordinance in this case says borrowing of three million, not up to. And we've done that just about every, in fact, as far as I know, every single year we borrow $3 million. We don't borrow up to or shy under. This is why those adjustments were made in the Capital Improvements Commission. And as for layoffs, 
I've said before that I, it was a last resort that I wanted to get into. I'm working on the budget now, refine, refining the budget, and I believe we've got it to where there will be no layoffs. So we need not worry about that. As far as a want versus a need, this is not a want, folks. This is a need. And I'm going to hear about it again if we have a brutal snow because I'm the one that gets the phone calls. I know it's a need. I get the calls, call, phone, calls, phone calls every single day. We will continue. Alderman Bauk. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I actually had a question for uh, Director Bittner as well. Um, Bill? Mr. Bittner? And while he's coming up, if I could just ask, uh, Your Honor, uh, Alderperson Gisha mentioned uh, that, and I think this might be what the difference is between made the cut or made the cut and didn't make the cut. If it made the cut, wouldn't it have been fully funded? I think what Alderperson Gisha was saying was that commission only has the authority to spend up to a certain amount of money and that this shed sounds like it was at the bottom of the barrel and we ran out of money. I mean, they didn't have enough money to fully fund it and so therefore it didn't make the cut. I think that's what he was referring to. And so it was the last priority of the Capital Planning Commission. I think that's the point he was trying to make. Is that a fair? Okay. Uh, and then for Director Bittner, um, so l l would you prefer, given that this shed is going to last somewhere between 50 and 75 years, and I don't know where that number came from, but it's a long-term investment, would you rather have a, an inadequate small shed now or potentially wait a year, see what happens with the economy, see what the, happens with the taxpayer's ability to pay, and then perhaps build the Taj Mahal of salt sheds a year from now? Wh which would be the most prudent, given that we're in this for the long term, not just for the next year or two years? Which would you, which would you think would the best, be the best spend of the taxpayer's money? I believe with, with the right layout, we could stage a campus of salt sheds because that's what almost everybody has to deal with. Um, the salt sheds I've been built in the past have un never been a, a salt shed because we didn't have one, so we started out meeting all our needs. They've always been added to. Uh, so I believe we can make a significant improvement in our operations with anything that would add uh, or double our capacity. So a small salt shed now wouldn't be a bad investment given the long term? No, no we would never then not use it. You would add to rather than uh, build your immediate need. And would that be less efficient than just building a big one? Uh -oh. I think the economies of scale would work. That's why we proposed mm -hmm. the big one. But if you understand that using your word, whether you have a need or a want, we, we would go a long ways to meeting a need, having some form of salt chain. OK. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to uphold a rule two, twice for Alderman. Otherwise, we're going to be here all day. Yes. What, do you need another question? Oh, Bill? Well, we, I've got uh, Alderman Clayunas is next. I'm taking them in order. Twice per issue, that's it. I'm going, and uh, two of you have already one have spoken twice. Alderman Clayunas? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I can concur with what you said in terms of the capital budget and the operational budget. This is a capital item, and we can't be talking about hiring somebody out of capital money. That doesn't work that way. So um, if, we are, if something's going to happen with personnel and, and uh, DPW, that can't be uh, amended by capital money. I do think that um, with the, the cuts that are made in public works, we ought to do something to alleviate what might be a real cut in services. And I do think that salt is an issue um, that had, was a problem last year. Mr. Bittner's developed some um, plans for how the salt can be more used more efficiently with the way it's spread. But I still think that we need to have enough on hand and not just twiddle our thumbs and watch everybody drive through ruts for three days before the shipment comes through. I mean, I, I, it, was a, it was a case. And, um, uh, I do believe in prayer, but I don't think I'm going to pray for a mild winter. Um, I think that's foolish. I think that's. I think we have to be. Um, uh, what is it? The the hare and the tortoise. No, no, it's nothing else. It's some one animal prepared for the winter, one animal didn't, and then the animal didn't ran looking for salt for the winter uh, from some other city that had prepared. So um, I really think it's something like that, as simple, as silly as that. I do think it has some common sense to it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Owen Ryan, second time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I do not have any more questions for Mr. Bittner. But uh, I, I, I would still like to address this. OK, we, we can borrow in capital improvements. We have an earmark of $3 million. 
So what we're saying here is we're going to make sure we borrow all $3 million because in the past we've always borrowed $3 million. So what the heck, let's borrow $3 million. We don't want to borrow uh, $2,740,000. We'll borrow the whole $3 million. And then we'll build a smaller salt shed because it might do for a while, but we'll have borrowed all of our $3 million. To me, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, last winter was an extraordinary winter. It was a winter that I haven't seen since I was a kid around here. And I, I would not bet my short-lived political career on this. However, I doubt this winter is going to be as bad as last winter. And, and to, to, to borrow the $266,000 for the sake of borrowing it, because we usually borrow $3 million, to build a small salt shed, um, to me, just doesn't make any sense at this point. So I'm, I'm going to vote against this. Thank you. Alderman Ver Hazel, second time. Thank you. Uh, can I ask? I have a question for Alderman or Department Head Bittner. <laughs> Bill? And perhaps someone from finance can even answer this, but um, <laughs> these numbers that are floating around, has there been any bid process or even quasi-bid process? Where are these numbers even coming from? The numbers we developed were from manufacturers of these facilities. Keep in mind, they're very unique facilities. They're facilities designed specifically to store a, a very corrosive product. Uh, so there's a number of manufacturers. And the costs are, are pretty much relative to the size or the space you want to put. The free span buildings, the ability to, to drive dump trucks around in them with the body raised. Uh, so the, the dollars we've used are from specific quotes we've got from two or three manufacturers. At the time, the original proposal was to meet uh, that relatively bad case scenario. Uh, okay. The number that you can probably build one in the area, uh, a smaller one for in the 250,000 comes more from my experience having done such. OK, thanks. I have a question for you. Sure. You're Thank, you. Right. Thank you, Bill. Here. Is it my opinion that we could still have the staff? Absolutely. I think and the salt shed. The salt shed, is, you have to understand, it's coming from a different pot. It's a borrowing. We have to borrow that money. It's a capital improvements program, OK? <coughs> and to even suggest that just because we spent $3 million every year, we shouldn't be doing that. There's always, the city has always had needs. This is why we get a barrage of requests. And this is why there's such a thing as a cut. <coughs> because when they're rated, 10 may make it, and the other 15 or 20 may not. So, so we have more needs, and we have more money. And we have more needs than we had the ability or the authority to borrow. This is why not long ago you, you approved an additional $2 million for strict uh, flood mitigation. Okay. Now, again, we're going to say we're not going to spend $2 million on flood mitigation this year because we don't need to just because we have it. Well, we've got a lot of flood issues here. So, again, we have a lot of salt issues here. And do we have that, the personnel? Absolutely. I think I have absolute faith in Bill Bidner doing his job. And I, 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 I hope that this not send a message to him that we're doubting his good judgment. What's your opinion we can afford both? Yes. Right. Okay, please call the roll. I oh. had my light on. I'm sorry. That's all right. You had your light? Yeah. Okay, I'll get you. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Second uh, time. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and last, hopefully for the evening. Uh, thank you to older person uh, Clayunas and to yourself for helping people understand that you don't use single time money for long term expenses. In other words, you don't use capital money for employee expenses. You just, I mean, it, we're talking about two separate things and it was very important to do those two. But, uh, and I have ultimate faith in Director Bittner as well. I don't question his judgment, but I listened to his words. He was tasked to come up with a scenario of capital, meaning whatever means necessary to cover what was an extraordinary winter season that 
it was so horrible, we got to do something about it. The way uh, it was, uh, the city was covered with salt and plowing. And we had to do something about it. What, do we, wh what does that mean? Well, salt check. That's assuming, the assumption that was made there was what the, that the city of Sheboygan, the Department of Public Works, did a crappy job on the streets last year. And I don't think they did. We sat in this room and praised them for the work they did with what they had to work with. So I don't think they did a rotten job. I know people get phone calls. And Mayor, you mentioned you get phone calls and don't hold you accountable. You're not the only one who gets phone calls. We all get phone calls on this. And I've said to them, I think they're doing a great job. And I think uh, it's, worth, it's worth every dime we're paying them. They did a terrific job in an extraordinary situation. So if that was the task given to Director Bittner, was to come up with something to fix uh, a crappy job, I don't think there was a crappy job. I was very satisfied with the work they did last year. And I don't think a salt shed is going to, uh, at this time, is using that amount of money is worth, is worth uh, any sort of increase in the service we would have received, like we did last year, in an incredibly horrible, over the top, one in a, as Alderman Ryan called, maybe one in a hundred years. It can be his political career on that one. Um, <laughs> so it, it, based on the tasking he, he was given on this, uh, I th and, and under the presumption that it was, a, it was a crappy job, or they didn't have enough whatever to do a, a better job, well, heck, I thought they did a pretty darn good job. And I think we praised them in this, in this room several times. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Murphish. Actually, my point's been taken. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Kittleton, second time. Thank you, Your Honor. And again, I just say we came through with the capital improvements we, with a positive recommendation for the salt shed. It came through City Plan Commission with a positive recommendation. I think we should just we should go ahead and uh, just approve what the <coughs> capital improvements has decided upon. Thank, Thank you. you. We will find out. Please call the roll. Okay. I, yeah, I will. First of all, we have an amendment on the floor that we have to vote on. The amendment is that the capital improvements to add back the 266000 in general obligations, general um, borrowing, and the corresponding 522000 total cost of the salt shed. So an I vote would be to add back into the program. That's the amendment that's on the floor right now. OK, is everybody clear on that? OK, Rinflesh? No. Ryan? No. Zurich? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. For Hassel? No. Wangaman? No. Born? No. Bauk? No. Decker? No. Gisha? No. Hannah? No. Heidemann? No. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunas? Aye. Meyer? Aye. And Montemayor? Aye. Six eyes, ten no's. Motion fails. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, with that motion failing, then I would like to amend the resolution to include the 261 in borrowing and use that for stormwater projects in 2009. Okay. Hold on just a second. Yes. To include 266,000 for? Uh, yeah, for stormwater abatement. That's a, that's a problem we're facing for many years ahead of us. Is there a second? Second. Under discussion. Oh, Vice President Bourne, first. Thank you, Your Honor. Could I have uh, somebody explain what those stormwater projects would entail for that amount of money? Is there Paulette? Thank you, Mayor and Common Council. I don't have the list in front of me that deals with the flood mitigation projects, but I know that you know there's a variety of projects, and if anything, what we could do is add to the many storms that we're putting in. Roughly, we have 200,000, and we could increase that number. So at a minimum, that's what we could do with the 266. Okay. Well, we got, I'm going to take them in the order I got them. Uh, Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I do not have any questions for Please. Paulette, but uh, oh, thank you, Paulette. You know, it, it seems to me here now we're throwing out stormwater abatement, which stormwater abatement is a great thing. It directly affects the citizens of the city. 
But it appears to me that we're just borrowing for the sake of borrowing to the max capacity that we can. We're going to get in the extra $266,000 and just shift it somewhere else. I, I don't agree with it. To, to at this point, you know, go from a, from a, a salt shed to stormwater abatement, which I have nothing against because I actually have people in my district that still have stormwater issues. That's why we, we, we agreed to, to borrow an extra $2 million for stormwater abatement. Now to throw in that just because we need to borrow our full $3 million for the year does not make any sense to me. I'm going to vote against it. Alderman Brassel. My question, thank you, Your Honor. My question was asked, I guess, but I did want to comment. I've gotten a ton of requests over the last couple of years for mini storm sewer type things. I mean, and I know that the well's kind of been dry there. Um, every time we go to ask that, they've been put on a long, a long list <coughs> and rarely dealt with. So, I mean, I like the idea of going towards mini storm sewer, not from the concept of just trying to spend some money somehow, but I think it's a very valid concept. So. Thank you. Alderman Bulk, you're next, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, if I could ask... Uh, uh, Paul had another just quick question to educate us Paul. really quickly because two hundred sixty-six thousand dollars in the grand scheme of things is not a whole lot of money. So I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to understand how that benefits. I don't know what a mini storm sewer is and how many of those can you get for two hundred sixty-six thousand dollars and how many people does that benefit, please? Right now we have a waiting list and then from that list, what we've been doing is trying to put in a cost estimate on each one of those projects. And typically, what you do is you go in and you do maybe three or four in an area. And so we're costing those out, and I know that we're not going to make it through that list with 200000 So we will need additional funding because those requests keep on coming in. So are those just additional storm sewers in people's neighborhoods where we chew up the curb, install one, and it drains into that and it drains away? Yeah, they're smaller ones that go from the homes and then come in so that it mitigates the flooding in their, in in their yard. Okay, that helps. And so for $266,000, what does that get us? In ballpark, rule of thumb. Does that get us five extra storm sewers? Does it give us 25? No, it could be. I, don't, I hate to guess, but let's say it would give us at least another 20. Okay, so that's 20 citizens that could, could be. I think we could double. I think we're, we're working through a list, and some of them are more expensive than others. So, like I said, without having my numbers right sure. in front of me, but I know that we could probably more than double the list that we'll have for 2009. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Holman Montemayo. Thank you, Your Honor. That's all I was going to say. Pretty much what, what um, Ms. Ender said is the stormwater sewer abatement is on the capital improvements list. It's on the list. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. Thank you. It's, uh, it's actually a separate list, if I recall, because we, we bond separately for stormwater. And uh, I don't have any issue with the money going to the stormwater fund. Actually, the mayor challenged the Department of Public Works and and Paulette to come up with a, a very comprehensive list. So we're not creating something. The mayor had already foreseen this, this need, and I suppose he gets more calls than we do as the central location on this. So we do have a list to be able to, to not just throw $266,000 at nothing. We have the, the, the list has been put together and, if I'm not mistaken, all been prioritized. That was shared with, with the committee, uh, the Capital Improvements Commission. And, uh, and there is, we ran out of money at the $2 million. There are projects right below that. And Mary, you can comment on that if you wish. I believe you gave them the charge to come up with this. We do have a document and, and, and numbers to, uh, to back up. Uh, and it have been prioritized. Thank you. OK, on the amendment, please uh, repeat the amendment. And uh, call roll. The amendment is to include 266000 for stormwater abatement in the capital improvements program. And I vote would do that. <coughs> Please call roll. Ryan? No. Zurich? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhassel? Aye. Wangaman? No. Boren? No. Bauk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunas? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. And Rinfleisch? No. 12 ayes, 4 noes. Motion carries. And that was it, right? Took care of, um, care of, do you need the uh, motion? I need to have the original motion to accept and adopt and pass the resolution. Did you do it? Sure. Let me see if I get this right. I, I make a motion to uh, to accept and adopt as amended. Is that and, and accurate? And pass the amended resolution. And pass the amended resolution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second to that? Second. Second. Under discussion. There is none. Please call the roll. A second here. 
Surat. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhasselt? Aye. Wangaman? No. Boren? Aye. Bauk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunis? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? No. And Ryan? No. 13 ayes, 3 noes. Motion carries. Report of Committee 9, 1552 by Public Protection and Safety recommending creating Section 118-11 of the Sheboygan Municipal Code so as to regulate the use of mobile telephones and other electronic devices by motor vehicle operators. President Hanna. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, I, I move that the report of committee be accepted and adopted, and that I move that the ordinance be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Alderman Wangaman. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. The issue of uh, cell phones is an issue that's been batted around a lot, and I don't think there's a single person in this entire room or probably in our listening audience that uh, doesn't agree that cell phone usage is a, is a severe hazard on the road. Uh, our reaction to this was to come up with an ordinance. However, if you check the Wisconsin State Statutes, 34689 subsection 1, and uh, I quote, no person while driving a motor vehicle shall be so engaged or occupied as to interfere with the safe driving of such a vehicle. The statue is uh, known as inattentive driving. It's also a primary statute whereby an officer, if he sees someone talking on a cell phone, can pull them over and stop them. This uh, ordinance or this law was adopted by the city of Sheboygan along with the entire motor vehicle code many years ago. And it's there, it's on the books, it's there today. And all it takes is enforcement. We don't need another ordinance. I'm not against uh, creating an ordinance to prohibit cell phone usage. I'm not for cell phone usage at all. I, I agree it's a hazard. But when you define cell phone usage, you're saying this is a real critical issue. This, this causes accidents, and I agree. Nobody knows that better than myself. I spent 28 years in an ambulance, so I know what it means to have uh, people smashed up in accidents. And uh, the, it's particularly uh, a problem amongst teenagers because it's well known teenagers use their cell phones probably a good more deal more than most of us do. But to pile a law on top of a law really makes no sense. In fact, I've talked to many police officers and they feel the same way. They said, we have an ordinance, we have a law. It's in place right now, today, tonight. They can go right out and enforce it. If the department if it feels that it's felt the department is not enforcing the law properly, then we should perhaps uh, have a discussion with the chief to see to it that his men enforce this. But this is an enforceable law right now, today. And it defines it very clearly. To be so specific as to say a cell phone or other electronic uh, devices, then there's all kinds of other things that figure into it also. I mean, what about people who put on lipstick or people who comb their hair while driving? The other day I saw a guy holding up a road map, reading a road map. This is all covered under inattentive driving. And again, I'm very much against cell phone usage. And I think the uh, police department needs to be uh, encouraged to really become strict on this. And it's a primary offense. An officer can stop someone that he sees uh, driving and talking. He can pull them over and issue a citation immediately. So uh, I could not support another ordinance, but that doesn't mean I'm for uh, cell phone usage while driving. It only means that I think we should apply the laws that are regular, uh, already on the books and not uh, bring in a, an extra one. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Sark. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, just want to make two points. One, I'd, I'd like to have us reflect back on the comments that Dr. Gruber made in an early part of this meeting. and and the concern that he has and what he's experienced you know, in, in the area of the cell phones. The other thing is that uh, we all received a letter from uh, Lori Lorenz, I think uh, all the council members did, and just to let the viewing public know, Lori Lorenz is the uh, driving instructor <coughs> for Lakeshore Driver's School, and she basically teaches our teenagers how to drive, and, and she brings up some very important points about uh, the hazard of, of using a cell phone, uh, a handheld cell phone while driving. And she brings up a 10, 
uh, tragedies that occur directly related to cell phone usage. And I won't read the whole letter or go through the through each of these sad cases, but her, her last comments uh, says to us as to all of them, I have been in contact with many, many of the families of these victims, any of the, the 10 victims that were involved. And I have promised them that I will do everything in my power to get their stories out as well as work on laws to prevent any further tragedies from occurring. Thank you for your time. I urge you to consider all that may be lost by people using their cell phones while driving. If you have any questions, please feel me to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. President Hanna. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I, too, am opposed to both hands-free and hands-held use of cell phones. The more I looked into this issue, the more I changed my own behavior. I don't use a cell phone anymore while driving, and I would encourage everybody not to. Whether it's hands-free or hand-held, there's a problem with paying attention. Driving's a complicated issue, and we need to be focused on it. I have talked to numerous police officers in the city of Sheboygan, and they have all gotten back to me and said, no, we do not need this. The inattentive uh, driving statute covers this. We are well equipped to enforce this. So they've asked me not to vote in favor of the cell phone ban. They felt that inattentive driving already covered it. Thank you. Alderman Rinfleisch. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I agree with the comments that Dr. Gruber had said. Uh, first one said, everyone knows that driving while using a cell phone is dangerous. I don't think that anybody in this room doubts that. We've heard comments, uh, and, and no one believes otherwise. Uh, but I do believe that his comment that we need a law uh, is perhaps inappropriate because we do have a law, as Alderman Wangaman stated. 34689, no person while driving shall be so engaged or occupied as to interfere. The, thing, the reason why I like the inattentive rule that's on the book already is that it does give the discretion to the officer. It uh, allows for the officer with their experience on the street, their knowledge, their experience. I'm not an expert at public safety. They are. Uh, and it allows them to decide, is just the cell phone usage? Is the person shaving? Is the person reading the map? What all constitutes inattentive driving? And I'm afraid that if we just highlight cell phone usage, we're allowing a free pass to others. We're, we're enforcing one rule instead of enforcing them all. Uh, and um, I trust the, the professionals out there, uh, the professionals, the police force, that none of the uniform officers came forward and said, this is one I I'll want to have. So I'm going to go with the re their recommendation and say that I will trust their judgment to decide what is inattentive. Cell phone usage, texting, changing CDs, talking to their friends, lighting a cigarette, eating fast food. It's all up to the police officer to decide uh, something that's, that's prosecutable or not. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll go with their recommendations and uh, I'll support them. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. Thank you. I didn't make many of the meetings that this was discussed at, but I just have a couple of questions if Alderperson Surik or somebody else could answer. The ordinance um, refers to electronic devices. Does that include GPSs in the car, iPods, MP3 players? So you can't use a GPS under this ordinance or your iPod or your MP3. And was it, was it addressed as to um, using a hands, when you use a hand, your phone hands free, now that's allowed, it's my understanding with this ordinance, you still have to use your other hand to dial or answer it anyway. So again, I, I'm, I'm curious as to maybe the background on, on that. And what, uh, what about I-43? Would we need a sign when we enter the city limits of the city of Sheboygan saying you can't use your phone and on the other side you can or on the off ramps you can't but on the on ramps you can? I know that the city of Sheboygan is responsible or has the ability to patrol a certain portion of I-43. I talked to the state patrol about it. Um, how do we deal with that? Just curious if those were vetted out through the discussions in committee. Alderman Sark, second time. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in answer to Alderman Gish's question, well, <clears throat> Assistant Attorney uh, Chuck Adams put together the ordinance. It was based on basically Marshfield. <coughs> and when he talks about hands free, we're not including GPS. Hands free, you don't hold a GPS in your palm of your hand when you're using it, generally around the, on, the, on, the, on the dashboard. He's talking about basically uh, handheld items, which <coughs> include cell phones. And if you want to hold a DVD for player in your hand, I guess that would apply too. Uh, in terms of, 
I guess, notifying the public, it seems to me that that this, this ordinance or this law is becoming very popular that uh, as you go down the Illinois Tollway, and I'm sure you've done that, there's a sign that says, you know, it does not allow cell phones. City of Chicago does that. City of Chicago, I'm sorry. Uh, New York City uh, does not allow cell phones. If you were to do a little research on, on the issue, uh, you would see that it's, it's, a, growing, it's a growing item uh, throughout the United States and throughout the world. I mean, there are, there are numerous, I'd say 90% of the countries throughout the world ban cell phone use while driving. So there's, there's something there. I mean, it's, we, seem be, we seem to be missing the point that uh, I, I, don't, I don't think equate using a phone to having a hamburger, which I'm saying is not good, or having a cup of coffee. A cell phone is particularly hazardous uh, procedure, I think, when you're, because you are losing focus on what you're doing. Thank you. And for a call, I just want to make a point that uh, judging from the discussion that has been going on, which I think has been a very good one, I think what the uh, citizen point and what Alderman Sorek's point is that to try to make is that although we have an uh, inattentive uh, statute that governs this type of behavior, it's usually a consequential type. Here you're trying to prevent the accident, not trying to deal with it or, <coughs> or, or after it's happened. And I believe I got that email too, and I believe that uh, that's one of the points that the individual was trying to make is that this is a good way to prevent the loss of lives or injury because as soon as a police officer sees a phone, they deal with it. So usually I, I would go up in the 90%, high 90s, uh, uh, inattentive driving citations are issued after something's already occurred. Alderman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I was opposed to this in public protection and safety. However, I voted for it to bring it to council because I could not make up my mind how opposed to it I was at the time. Um, you know, I, I, I look at it as over-regulation in a way. Um, however, we all know how dangerous talking on a cell phone in a car is because I bet most people, with the exception of Gene Kittleson here, are guilty of it. <laughs> I had to say that because Alderman Kittleson says she's never used a phone in a car before, but most people are guilty of it, and I'm sure everybody's been in a situation where you've been trying to fumble with your phone and, and probably could have been in a bad situation. Um, so I think that's, you know, from that point of view, this is, is probably a good ordinance. I, I have a 16-year-old daughter who got her driver's license about two weeks ago. And the first thing I told her to do was you better turn off your phone and it better be in the glove box. Because the first time I catch you with it out of the glove box when you pull up to the house is the last time you're going to be driving my truck. Um, that's called personal responsibility, which is another part of this. People should have personal responsibility. However, if you do have a, a rule out there that encourages your personal responsibility a little bit more, I don't see it as a bad thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm, you know this is, is one of those things. That, you know, I, I used to spend a long time on the road in the morning. I'd spend an hour plus on the road, sometimes an hour and a half driving around the county, and I would get all my work done on my cell phone. Um, so I'm very guilty of, of, of making a lot of calls on my cell phone. And, um, but, you know, this is, this is one of these things that you, you, you hate to vote for a big brother statute. You also hate to, to vote for something that's going to be another, uh, another uh, rule like prohibition, where the, the rule is there and people just ignore it. And, and everybody's breaking the law because they've always done it. But uh, I'm going to vote for it. Uh, why I, I'm 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 totally torn on this thing, uh, but for the the sake of my kids, I guess, and and maybe I'll uh, this way it'll uh, teach me to, uh, teach me personal responsibility myself when I have to do it. Alderman Wagaman, second time. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Just just one comment yet. I'd like to know. An ordinance is supposed to accomplish something. We make ordinances because we want them to accomplish something. Well, I'd like to know, what is this ordinance going to accomplish that we already don't have under the state statute? That's what I'm, I wish somebody, somebody has an answer to that. And uh, I appreciate Alderman Ryan's concern for his children. But uh, I, have, uh, I have grandchildren. I happen to be just a few years older than you. But, uh, and I'm concerned about them as well. So, but uh, what is this ordinance supposed to accomplish? I wish if somebody has an answer for me. 
I, I wish they would give it to me that the state statute does not already provide us. Thank you. Thank you. And Clarita's. Thank you, Your Honor. I think the answer is that people will use, not use their cell phone in the car. I think that's what it would accomplish um, is that because people, it's not a law or an ordinance right now, it's buried within a, um, you know, a statute, um, but people don't know that uh, unless it's told to them you can't do this. Just like drunk driving, people they need to be told you can't drive drunk. Uh, they don't seem to have that common sense about it. They have to be told you can't drive drunk. And I think some people have to be told you really shouldn't, you shouldn't be driving and using a cell phone. I guess it's, that's the purpose of the ordinance, that some people need to be told. They don't have that rule in their heads. Thank you. Okay, we are going to call the vote on 1552, and that's the ordinance that uh, creates the uh, cell phone usage. Please call the roll. Vanderweel? No. Verhassel? No. Mongaman? No. Boren? No. Bauk? No. Decker? No. Gisha? No. Hannah? No. Heidemann? No. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunis? Aye. Meyer? Montemayor, Rinfleisch, no. Ryan, Aye. and Surik. <coughs> six ayes, ten noes. Motion, six ayes, motion carries. No, six ayes, six ten noes. Oh, fails. motion fails. My, my apology here. 1552. Ordinance introduced ten. Uh, 1553 lies over, matters laid over, 11, 1428 resolution, resolution number 134809 by Alderman Montemayor, adopting the neighborhood revitalization strategy area plan. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that the resolution be put upon its passage, and I would also like to open the floor. Okay, hold on, hold on. Is there a, mo a second to that motion? Second. second. Okay, second, and then under discussion, you'd like to make a motion to open the floor? To Jan Wilberg, who has helped us come up with this wonderful plan. She has worked very hard, and I understand it's a fairly short presentation. Okay. Jan is not a department head. We do need a, a second to that motion. Second. Second. Any discussion on opening the floor? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Jan, would you please come up? Paulette, Chad. evening. We will make this as short as possible, um, but we do want to inform you about the neighborhood revitalization strategy area. Um, we have Jan Wilberg from Wilberg Community Planning, Chad Pelishek, our economic development manager. And what NARSA is, is it's a plan that um, is under HUD. And what HUD does is they let you target on a distressed area you, you set boundaries, which we'll go through. You can go in, what, it minimizes the red tape that we typically have with HUD. And then we can, uh, we go in, we do a lot of research gathering, surveys. Uh, we had some informational meetings, we come up with a plan. We submit the plan to the Common Council for adoption. It then goes on to HUD. And then we can begin implementing, if they approve it, implementing the goals that, that we have laid out. So we won't have any additional funding, but what we'll be able to do is use our existing HUD monies in a less restrictive manner in order to make a significant impact on a distressed area. So I'll let you begin. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mayor and Council Members. Thanks for having us tonight. We're going to do this very briefly. You received a copy of the plan, I believe, at your last meeting. So all of the detail is there. So if the slides go by pretty quickly, you'll know that you can find the detail in the actual plan. Um, the required elements of a NARSA, the Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area, HUD requires that you do certain things, and all of these things were done in Sheboygan. Um, we identified a targeted area. We convened a stakeholder committee that had about 26 representatives. We conducted an assessment, developed goals and objectives, and very specific performance measures that are going to be used in the future to assess progress. Um, Chad's going to just briefly walk you through the boundaries um, of the targeted neighborhood. Oh, okay. 
for those of you that have been at the meetings, you've kind of heard this before, but the boundaries on the map on the left you'll see takes on the census tract number five, which is kind of in the city center area. This was actually gonna be focused on from 9th Street to 14th and then from Erie up to Superior, but HUD wouldn't agree to those boundaries because of the census numbers. So they made us expand it out and we're actually on the south side, um, we're near Center Avenue all the way to Superior and then that chunk to the far left is Saman Avenue and then we're taking it from 9th Street all the way to 14th Street. It's a very big area and it's, you know, it's gonna be a, hu it's a huge area undertaking, but what we've done in the plan and Jan will describe it more is divided it into service sector areas and we've divided down to five areas and each year we're gonna focus on each one of those areas and you know, try to really make an impact in them. So I, I believe our first area is the kind of distressed, the mostly distressed area of this area, which is the 9th Street to 14th and like Ontario up to Superior. So that block is gonna be our first uh, part of this thing that we're gonna really focus on in the next couple of years. HUD requires um, that the targeted neighborhood meet uh, an income standard, and this neighborhood does. 64.5% are below the HUD low moderate income level, which is 80% of the county median income, it's around $40,000. Um, it has to be primarily re residential and certainly is, um, has a high proportion of renter occupied units and a lot of very old housing stock. Um, as part of our planning process, the stakeholder committee that was put together went through a process of identifying assets and challenges. And in terms of assets, just very briefly, location as sort of an entryway to the downtown, um, the economic potential that could be realized by the high traffic and by the existing businesses and the recreation that's already in the area, and the character. You know, older homes sometimes have um, housing <laughs> issues, but they often have historic value at the same time. So many assets identified in the neighborhood. But it wouldn't be targeted for this kind of special treatment if there weren't challenges. And the challenges identified by the stakeholders fall into these three categories, the general appearance, um, that it's not a good, uh, good looking entryway into the city. The condition of housing, uh, boarded up windows, um, declining housing stock, a lot of absentee landlords, this was stressed a lot. And issues facing the residents themselves. High incidence, this was from the perception of the stakeholders, of alcohol and drug abuse, a lot of turnover, residential turnover, people moving in and out. Um, and, and from law enforcement, we heard a lot of late night policing um, issues, uh, drug dealing, behavior issues. We followed up on the stakeholder uh, input with a neighborhood survey, which was conducted on a Saturday morning in May. We had 18 volunteers, several aldermen participated as volunteers in this um, survey. We interviewed face to face 160 people and we use the results to really help us understand more about the neighborhood. And I'm not gonna go line by line here, but I just wanna draw your attention. Top neighborhood problems, crime, drugs, and violence, and then right next to it, people not wanting to get involved in neighborhood improvement. So people really saw those things sort of hand in hand. And then you see the abandoned rundown buildings and some of the other issues falling down um, uh, behind those top two. <coughs> On the asset side, you know, when you ask people to identify issues, and they certainly did, we also asked them about their level of satisfaction in the neighborhood. This is how you know there's something to build on in that neighborhood, because a significant proportion of people are happy in the neighborhood, and they may have to move, but most of them, 56%, plan to stay. That's your core of neighborhood change, are the people who are happy, satisfied, and intend to stay. We ask about employment problems. The NARSA has to focus on economic issues, employment and housing. So we ask about employment problems. What problems are you experiencing in finding and keeping a job? A lack of jobs in the neighborhood and then um, uh, to, mu to a much smaller proportion, not having childcare, disability, lack of transportation. There are a lot of barriers, but they don't, they don't actually affect a huge number of people. But that lack of jobs in the neighborhood was identified as the number one issue. We ask about level of education. Now this is sort of a two-sided coin. 19% uh, uh, haven't finished high school. 
At the same time, you have a good number of people who, 29 plus the 8 plus the 1, who are, um, who have attended college or have completed college. So you've got sort of both ends of the spectrum in that neighborhood. <coughs> Economic issues, we ask people to tell us their income um, before taxes. And, and uh, we did have about 10% who, who didn't want to answer that question. Um, but here you can see that the neighborhood is uh, low income. Most household incomes were under $40,000. This is consistent from what we knew from the census. We also asked uh, whether um, anyone in the respondent's family participated in a public benefit program. And this was an area where there was a, kind of a big surprise because one out of three people that we talked to out of that 160 were involved with um, SSI or SSDI, which are both programs that support people with disabilities. So disability issues are a big issue in that neighborhood. Um, and to a lesser extent, food stamps, uh, Medicaid, Badger Care, some of the other programs are also utilized, but to a much lesser extent than SSI and SSDI. So this brings us to our goals. Um, what we did uh, with the stakeholder group was to bring back the survey results, sit down with that group, and establish some key areas that needed to be addressed with this NARSA plan. And out of that identification came the four goals that are included in the plan and then they're detailed with specific objectives. And when you look at the, the um, full plan, you'll see those objectives spelled out. The first goal is to significantly improve the quality of housing through enhanced code enforcement and investment in housing maintenance and rehabilitation. Um, the second is to address and improve the economic well-being of the neighborhood by encouraging business development that will generate jobs for residents. The third is to improve the quality of life in the neighborhood through efforts to improve public safety and increase community involvement. And you can see here we're really trying to attack all of these uh, highest priority issues that were identified by, both by the stakeholders and the residents. And last is to continue to invest in city infrastructure uh, within the NARSA. I know um, Chad wanted to speak more specifically about some of the activities that would be included under each of these goals. Oh, and you want your microphone back. Under this, under the implementation part of this, we're going to try to um, take some of our existing funds and reutilize them out of the housing rehab program and do a five-year type forgivable loan to do facade improvements and landscaping of the houses. That would be a new program we're going to try to get off the ground well, if this is approved by HUD and to try to make quick results of what is happening out there. Um, we're also looking at um, some other business development loan uh, packages to try to encourage new business startup and expansions. Working with the Gateway Neighborhood Association that's been having troubles getting people involved in the neighborhood. Um, so under the Sustainable Neighborhood Association, we're gonna try to implement that to get more people that are happy to be in this neighborhood but also to take part in the neighborhood. And the feeling is, is if we can get the people to have a sense of community, they'll respect that and hopefully clean up the neighborhood. Um, and then we've also identified infrastructure improvements, you know, streets, uh, the, the actual street infrastructure, uh, additional lighting. Uh, we've done that in some er other areas of the city. We're going to look at expanding that street lighting and also working on house lighting as well. So if the people apply to us for one of these new program uh, loans, they would be required to maybe put a a motion or a dust to dawn light on their house so that we get more light in the neighborhood to deter the stuff that's happening in the evening. Um, so we HUD requires us to set up five-year outcomes and then every year we have to report to them on our accomplishments um, once we get them to hopefully get them to approve this plan after hopefully you guys approve this plan um, we can start implementing these programs in our 2009 calendar year with the you know, assumption of trying to make some differences in the neighborhood. So with that, we'll open it if you guys have any questions for us. Otherwise, we would encourage you to approve this plan um, that is before you tonight. Thank you. President Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can we just go back to the slide where you canvass the neighborhood on <coughs> social services? Go back, oh, you that just one. passed it, that one there. Just to help me understand the, the, the data, um, <coughs> What you're saying is that 33% of the people were supplemental secu uh, social security income 
or disability, they could also be participating in other of these plans oh, also. Oh, correct, yes, okay. indeed. Okay. Thank so you. they wouldn't add up to 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Chad, yes, sir. thank you for a job well done. Chad, thank you too. Paulette, wonderful. I'm glad to see this program take off and meet me next year. Okay, moving along, we're on uh, 1429. Oh no, we need to uh, vote on 1428. There was a motion and a second to put the resolution upon its passage. Is there any other discussion? Vice President Bourne. Thank you, Your Honor. I just wanted to ask, uh, maybe this was covered and I missed it. This is only, this is the first of many neighborhoods that we're gonna be doing this project on. I'm very anxious to see it down in my, on the seventh district on the, on the near south side. I think it would be just huge for that area. Good point, Alwyn Bourne. Uh, you will recall that I, I talked about three NARSAs, first one being where it's at now, second one being up in the Kentucky area in your district, the third one being in District uh, 2, where I used to be in Alderman. That's behind the Y and all that area there that needs some, needs some attention. Uh, obviously, it, it's, it's a plan. It, it's a long-range plan. It takes a lot of, a lot of planning, uh, a lot of thought, and, and, and uh, leveraging of CDBG money. But we're right on track and it's working. And as I said, Jan has done an incredible amount of work and we're very grateful for a good job well done. Chad and you and Paulette too. Okay. Please call the roll. Per Hassel? Aye. Wonkerman? Aye. Boren? Aye. Bauk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Fionis? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Zurich? Aye. And Vanderweel? 16 ayes. Motion carries. 1429, resolution number 1350809 by Alderman Gisha, Clayunas, Boren, Bauk, and Montemayor, authorizing a transfer of appropriations in a 2008 budget, establishing appropriation for contribution from the West Bend Marching Band to the Police Department, revenue and appropriation for Mead Library, Library website, appropriation for Mead Library op operating expenses. Alderman Gisha. Thank you. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second. Under discussion. There is none. Please call the roll. Wangaman? Aye. Boren? Aye. Falk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Clionis? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Zurich? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. And Verhassel? Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. 1444, General Ordinance Number 650809 by Alderman Hannah, Rinfleisch, Ryan, Heinemann, and Kittleson relating to traffic signs and signals so as to add a stop sign on South 10th Street for northbound traffic at Greenfield Avenue. President Hannah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the ordinance be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second. Under discussion. There is none. Please call the roll. Warren? Aye. Bauk? Aye. Decker? Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Clionis? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Zurich? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Verhassel? Aye. And Wangaman? Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. 1445, General Ordinance Number 660809 by Alderman Montemayor, Zurich, Meyer, Decker, and Verhassel amending the Municipal Code so as to delete the position of Deputy Fire Inspector from the Fire Department Table of Organization. Alderman Montemayor. Thank you, Your Honor. I move the ordinance be put upon its passage. Second. Motion and second under discussion. There is none. Please call roll. Falk? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha? Aye. Hannah? Aye. Heidemann? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Clayunis? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Zurich? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Hassel. Wangaman and Boren. Aye. 16 ayes. Motion carries. Other matters authorized by law. Attorney McLean. Thank you, Your Honor. 1553A is an RO by the city clerk submitting Sporgan Area School District tax levy certifications to be used in 2009. That goes to finance. 1554 is an RO by the city clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2009 and June 30, 2010. That goes to law and licensing committee. 1555 is an RO by the finance director treasurer 
uh, as part of the budget process, the attached listing of the estimated unreserved fund balances at December 31, 2008, and outstanding debt as of December 31, 2008, is submitted for your review. That will lie over to uh, till November 24th. 1556 is a committee report by the Finance Committee indicating the Finance Committee has reviewed the committee reports from Public Protection and Safety, Law and Licensing, Public Works and Salary Grievances, and recommend approval of said reports with the attached amendments. That lies over to November 24th also. 1557 is a resolution ordering the 2009 budget appropriations for the City of Sheboygan funds. That goes to finance. 1558 is a resolution ordering the 2009 budget appropriations and the 2009 tax levy for use during the calendar year 2009. That goes to finance. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Stand adjourned.